Good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, very honored to be here, to be uh, sharing my experience with so many. The morning was uh, riveting uh, in the way of history and academia, and I've learned a lot from there. But there's no end to learning, so it goes on. Um, throughout history, the mystery and magic of indigo has fascinated people across the world. Myths and rituals associated with its unique color and dyeing process sets it apart from all other organic dyes. Its transformation from yellow to green and finally blue enthralls and intrigues people in equal measure. This is a, an image from Jenny. All of us, she's the source of all our images and knowledge. <laughs> so as she said that um, these the, when these uh, fabric fragments were excavated, they were three in the third millennium, from the third millennium BC. And now like her, I had known that uh, Mohenjo Daro had the old pits and some thread, not fabric thread. So that took it back to 5,000 years. Uh, what is important is how lasting the color of indigo is, so that, um, the blue frescoes have uh, frescoes and architecture. They've been exposed to light, dust, and moisture for centuries, and yet they have retained the blue, which shows the durability of this exceptional dye. As a trade com uh, commodity, indigo was highly coveted and reflected the importance of the country controlling its supply. In the 1800s, three dominant powers, Spain, France, and Britain, lost their supplies of indigo from Central America, the Caribbean, and North America, respectively. Britain re-emerged as the key, a key player and with its development of the Bengal indigo. British planters in the East India Company earned unimaginable wealth from indigo in Bengal. At the peak between 1834 and 47, the plantations of Bengal supplied 80% of the world's requirement of indigo. However, the coercive measures used by the planters, which we've heard of already, caused immense resentment amongst the farmers and took its toll on the production of indigo in Bengal. Combined with the discovery of synthetic indigo and its aggressive marketing in the captive colonial market of India, Bengal's in indigo was destroyed. It seemed forever. But after the bake of more than a century, a small initiative was undertaken by Aranya to revive indigo in Bangladesh. In 80, I just realized that you talked about Tindivana. Maybe our master dyer went there to learn about uh, how to cultivate and extract indigo. And in 84, we got 1984, we got a piece of land given to us from uh, the botan Botanical Gardens, which was a pilot project to see if we could revive indigo. At the end of that next year's season, we did e extract five kgs of indigo successfully. It was a miraculous discovery, and we were over the moon about it. But what we had not contended with was the negative impact of the history of indigo in the mind of the Bangladeshi farmers. So no matter how much we talked to them about this indigo being their own crop, they were absolutely not willing to cultivate indigo. So actually we had to put the project on hold, wondering if we'd ever be able to do it. In the 1990s, the Menendez Central Committee, an NGO, approached Aranya to discuss the possibility of reviving Indigo, working with Garos, who are a tribal community and didn't share the same history of uh, exploitation. And this was the thing that had remained in their minds, you know, not the positive side of it. So we come to the Mennonites, who used fantastically basic instruments, which was, I think, wonderful because most of the women worked in the project and they were not Im intimidated by gadgets or something they couldn't control. So from A to Z, their extraction process was simple, 
easy to replicate, easily available. So here they started growing their indigo in the Garo area, moving it at the crack of dawn to the production center, because as you know, you have to harvest it with sunrise or before and start working on it. So the women put these uh, leaves uh, along with the stem and into these drums, agitating them with little brooms um, gadget which they had made themselves so that they could precipitate it. So you had groups of women when we went visiting who were happily doing that. It was not uh, too difficult for them to do, but did the job, stirring it vig vigorously and happily. So here we have them taking out, as Mr. Balagan said before me, the sediment settles in the bottom. They removed it and drying it out by letting the uh, moisture, the water, slowly drain out of it. As I said, their system was very, very basic. And then sun dried it, <coughs> ground it into powder, and it was ready for use. As Jenny said, we don't have to do powder, but we'll have to wait till we get there. In 2000, a group of us, a number of us, suddenly discovered that indigofera was being cultivated for decades by farmers in North Bangladesh as a fertilizer and a fuel. So actually, indigo had never died out. Only its use had changed from dye to fertilizer. MCC relocated its program in the north, and the garos re reverted back happily to pineapple and other traditional crops. In 2000, CARE, another NGO, consulted Aranya and took on, undertook a pilot project to revive the indigo in collaboration with the farmers who were already cultivating in North Bangladesh, primarily a town called, around a town called Rangpur. After the initial years of successful experimentation, Living Blue set up, was set up in 2008 as a community-based project, producing and marketing indigo in collaboration with the community that they were working with. So it is an unusual project in the sense that the project belongs to the community. You see the morning harvesting of the plant, getting a little more sophisticated in a truck, and then you have a slightly more sophisticated way of precipitating it, rather than the women, women vigorously doing it. And then boiling it, and then drying it in the sun. This is their indigo, which looks absolutely edible. And then after that, they moved on along with it to developing an outstanding range of products, high value products, which have uh, really done extremely well. So this is a shibori which they've done, and a lot of, uh, mainly women, but some women, but some men also work in the center, making these exquisite textiles. An amazing development last year was Aranya's discovery that indigo, shiram, was being cultivated and used as a dye by the Muru community in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Unfortunately, the correct extraction process had been lost over time, with the indigo being rather light, what they were using, and not very fast. Aranya has taken up a project this year, the last year, with CCA, another local NGO as a partner, to work with the community to return Muru indigo to its original Kalafas, Shiram. So you see, this is the, it's a slightly hilly area. This is the end product that they managed to get. These were the colors. I think the problem was more a difference of color, but also color fastness. This is the project now, where five acres of land has been cultivated on an experimental basis, with the women doing it in the same cans, doing it by hand, drying it also in the same manner as MCC. This is the end product, and these are the happy women now. So this is their indigo. 
So you see how absolutely beautiful the end result was of the Mru indigo, and it is absolutely color fast. Aranya has produced, provided technical support both to MCC and CARE in the initial period, and is now working with the Mru community. But the real heroes of this success story of the revival of indigo in Bangladesh are the farmers who rec recognize the intrinsic value of indigo and continue to cultivate it as a traditional crop over the last 100 years, enabling us today to revive the lost Bengal indigo once again in Bangladesh. Thank you.